On this Wednesday, there's a rather personal reason for what I want to talk about. Today, 2nd of September 2020, is the 25th anniversary of the death of my mother, Millie, Amelia, to give the full form of her name. And I th I'm thinking about death and, of course, of life beyond death. You notice I don't say life after death because I think it only makes sense when we're talking about being removed from this world and this universe to shed the, the words, the ideas that belong to this universe and time is one of those. So outside time, talking about before and after doesn't make much sense. Where are we going to start then? Well, the compiler of the, uh, Matthew's Gospel, towards the, quite, quite early on in the Gospel, wanted to bring together a sort of compendium of the teaching that Jesus gave to the, the crowds and to his disciples in his, his, his ministry before he was, he was crucified. And we call that compendium of Jesus' teaching the Sermon on the Mount. It begins with the Beatitudes, giving a picture of the qualities of life which distinguish those who belong to God's kingdom in this world and the next. And the sermon goes on to describe much of the practical life that we live, coming eventually in chapter 7 of, of Matthew to great spiritual activities, prayer and fasting. Then quite suddenly, the words of Jesus break in after talk of prayer and fasting to say, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Treasure in heaven. Treasure. What sort of treasure, I imagine? Well, what has just been talked about, I suppose, the great qualities of life, the great achievements of life, that we can aspire to in this world if we're faithful to God, if we uh, lay hold of the grace that he so readily bestows on us to live according to his laws, according to his love. Treasure. And treasure, Jesus says, lay it up in heaven, store it up in heaven. So he's talking about the things that we have achieved, the things that we have become, the sort of people we are in this world, and transporting them in a word to heaven, to the eternal kingdom. Here we have then a very brief but telling way of saying that this life has some effect on eternal life, that life in this world has something to do with life beyond death, that the qualities and the achievements by God's grace of this world's life are the stuff on which we shall live as treasure in heaven. There's the first point in the Gospel then that I want to draw your attention to today. And I want to move forward to another Gospel reference towards the end of the Gospel, in fact, when St Luke, we move forward to St Luke's Gospel now, where St Luke is describing crucifixion, the passion and the death of our Lord Jesus. And that took place on the hill of Calvary and two others were crucified with him. One of them, one of them begins to judge his own life. We are suffering this justly, he says to his companion. We are suffering this justly. He condemns himself, if you like, and then he turns to Jesus. From himself he turns to Jesus and realising that there is something beyond what he has understood about this life, he asks that Jesus will know him in his kingdom. And what is Jesus' reply? Today you will be with me in paradise. Today? Yes, he is talking about now, the now which doesn't talk about before or after, but can talk about eternity. And he, talk, he says that he, the, the thief will be with him in paradise, not in the kingdom of God, not in heaven, 
certainly not in Sheol or Hades, but in paradise. And that word paradise is a word that means a garden. What happens in a garden? Well, things grow, don't they? Things come into bloom, they come into fruit. Growth is the, the, the mark of a garden. So is Jesus saying to us that he understands the eternal kingdom of God as a place where growth takes place? When we look at ourselves, when each of us looks at himself, we know that we are hardly fit to stand before God, that we are only a fraction of what we could be in God's love and in the power of his creation in our lives. So we hope that there will be an opportunity for growth beyond death. And that, I think, is what Jesus is telling the, the penitent thief on the cross. We can't talk about time in eternity, but we can and must talk about growth in eternity. And there's one more thing that I want to, to mention, uh, which is not in the Gospel, in fact, but which is a word that we commonly use when we're talking about death. And through all Christian ages, we've used this word, the word rest. We think of requiem, the Latin word, as enshrining that idea uh, in, in Western Christian tradition, don't we? The rest. And we pray for those who have been taken from us by death, we pray that rest may be theirs. Dear me, rest. Does that mean inactivity? Does that mean unawareness of what's going on around? Does that mean nothing happening to us? Oh dear, if that's so, then uh, just as uh, if, if, if heaven is a place of, uh, of, of harps uh, and white clouds, I'm not sure that's where I want to go. Uh, if, if rest means that, is that what we really believe is the, the, the destiny that God has in store for us? Well, just think back right to the beginning of the Bible and in that great hymn that opens the, the Bible as we have it today in the first chapter of Genesis, what does God do? What does God do with all his creation? Well, he makes it all in the, the six eons, if you like, the six days of, of, of creation that are described there. And then God rested the seventh day. The rest is the rest of God. Is that inactivity? Is that a lack of awareness? Is that no experiences happening to you at all? No, indeed it isn't, is it? It is the fullness of God's life, the fullness of God's life in and through and for his whole creation. And when we are praying for rest for those whom we love, we are not praying that they may be extinguished. We're certainly not praying that they should do and be nothing uh, at all. We are praying that they may be filled with the fullness of God and his life. Requiem eternam. Rest eternal. The, the state of God's perpetual love. That is what we are, we are praying for. The qualities of this life then that are translated into eternal life. The growth that we experience a little of, tempered so much by our own sinfulness and our own weakness in this life, being made full in the, in the, in the, in the, the eternal kingdom of God, and rest, the fullness of God's love. Our prayers are very often couched in rather dramatic terms, the sort of dramatic terms that were very popular in in medieval days, but let not those those dramatic words and the fiery figures that, uh, that that sometimes inhabit them take us away from the plain message of the gospel that it is in Jesus' love that we live in this world, that we will live beyond this world with His Him in His kingdom, His eternal kingdom of His Father for ever. So as we pray for those we love, our first thought for them is to be growing into the fullness of God's love.
Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, deliver all the departed from the power of death, from the pit of destruction. Save them from the lion's mouth. Do not let them go down into darkness. But let the archangel who leads your heavenly host make speed to restore them to the brightness of glory, which you promised in ages past to Abraham and his seed. To those we love and to all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, may they rest in peace. Amen.